As our kids go to their classes, would you stand with me please and open your Bibles to the book of Acts chapter 1. The book of Acts chapter 1 and we'll begin reading in verse 4. When you got it, say so. The word of the Lord says, And being assembled together with them, they, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, You have heard from me. For truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you this morning for your love toward us that is abundantly clear as we think about the cross, as we think about the great sacrifice that you made for us, that while we were yet sinners, you died for us, Lord. God, we're humbled by that reality this morning, and we are grateful, Lord, for the, the invitation that you give us to be in your presence. Not only that, but Lord God, we thank you for the invitation you give us to participate with you in this mission to reach those who don't know you, God. I pray this morning that our ears would be opened I pray this morning that our, that our hearts would be submissive. I pray this morning that your kingdom would come in our lives in a fresh way. And I pray that you would help us to see the mission field the way that you do. And we thank you for all of this. And we pray that you would remove every distraction of our minds and our hearts. Lord God, we stand against the enemy that would seek to distract us. We stand against every thought that would try to uh, get us away from thinking about your truth this morning. Father, we pray that you glorify yourself in the preaching and in the hearing of your word today. And we pray this all in Jesus' good name. And everyone said... Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. We have two outlines left. So if you need an outline, just raise your hand and the ushers will get you uh, an outline. So just keep your hand up and uh, the first two to raise your hand, you get them. After that, praise the Lord. You're on your own. You're going to take notes by yourself. Uh, on Friday, we had our, our prayer time. For those of you that were not here, I'm sorry that you missed it. But in that prayer time, as we were praying, we began to pray for lost people. And as we were praying for those who are unsaved, one of the fathers who was present began weeping before the Lord, crying out for his children's salvation. And as that began to happen, in prayer, I thought to myself, and I don't feel like it was just me, but I realized that there are many fathers and mothers who are praying for the salvation of their children. And I wonder if we are being unfaithful by not responding to the Lord to be those who are on mission with God. Because that parent is there and they are praying and they're crying out to God with desperation that God would bring a messenger to share the gospel with their child. Tears, brokenness, and any parent in this room that has a child that is far from you, you understand the reality of that pain, of that, of that concern, of that care, that my God, bring somebody. And I don't want to guilt you. I just want you to know you can be an answer to someone's prayers. Amen. You can be part of God responding to the prayers of broken people over broken people. You see, so we, we have this responsibility. We get, we get fearful when we talk about evangelism. I don't, I don't have the right words. I don't know what to say. I don't want to be rejected. I mean, you go down the list. There's plenty of things that come into our minds in those moments, and yet I want you to know that we, we are, have been called to engage with God on mission. That's what we want to talk about today. Engaging with God on mission. If you look at your outline there, when you look around, when you look at the world around you, what do you see? Think about that. 
When you look at the world around you, what do you see? Do you see a world that is shattered by sin, blinded to its own plight? Do you see a world that is basically good with just a few nut jobs? Do you see a world that is in rebellion against its creator on a path of destruction and condemnation whose only hope and greatest need is the gospel and yourself as God's ambassador, which means a missionary? When you look around the world, what do you see? I want you to hold your place there in Acts chapter 1. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 17. And we read this scripture again, for those of you who were here on, on Friday, we read this scripture. But here's, here, here's what, it, what it says, Acts chapter 17, verse 16. Look at this, these words here. While, now, while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. What do you see when you look around at the world? What, 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 do you, what, what happens to you? See, because when I say what you see, I'm not just talking about what you see with your eyes. I'm talking about what happens in your heart. What is going on inside of you? Because the Apostle Paul, when he looked around at the world around him, he was provoked inside of him. Uh, another translation uh, speaks of him being, his heart was, was stirred inside of him. He was distressed because of the idolatry that he saw going on. There was something that was moving him. And if you keep reading, we're not going to do that today. But if you keep reading in Acts chapter 17, you find the apostle Paul goes on and he begins to preach the gospel. He begins to bring revelation to this world, to this area of the world that does not know who the God of heaven is. They're, they're searching. There's, there's something inside of them that says there is a God. They just don't know who he is. And the apostle Paul realizes because of that aching in their soul, because of that something that is there, the condition. See, here's the thing. The people of Athens, the reason why they were given to idolatry, you know why it was? It was because there was an aching in their soul for the God who created them. And they were trying to figure out who this God is. And so they had this idol and that idol and this. They had the, 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 the altar area that was inscribed to the unknown God because they didn't know. Here's, here's why this is so important. Because that is no different than the world in which we see ourselves. The world around us is in the condition that it is in because it is seeking to fill a void that only the creator can. And so we, while we get bent out of shape and, and we get overwhelmed by the evil and the wickedness that we see, our hearts should be distressed. Our hearts should be provoked. Something inside of us should be like, my God, they're, they're, they're trying to fill a void. God, we have the void filler. Hello. We have the gospel. We have the truth Amen. that can bring them life. Something has to happen inside of our hearts. I want you to think about this this morning. God's mission to the world must be greater to us than our personal mission for our lives. God's mission to the world has to be greater to us than our personal mission for our lives. Think about your life right now. Does your life say, the mission of God is more important than any plan that I have. The mission of God is more important than any desire that I have. The mission of God is being lived out every day of my life. Think about that. What is the most important thing to you? What is the most important goal that you have? What is the thing that you are striving toward? My daughter, she's going to school. She has the desire to be a doctor. Praise the name of the Lord. You guys support her after church. I pray you will. She's going on a, on a, on a, on a, uh, a student mission type trip and she's going to do great things in South Africa. I think God is going to uh, show her some things she's never seen in her life. But here's the reality. The reality is that while she is on mission for herself, she is striving. She studies. She's devoted. She's in classes. She's doing all of that. There is something greater than her becoming a doctor. 
And that is that she realizes that God has a mission for her life. And I use my daughter as an example because obviously I'm raising her. We instill these values in her. We call her. We challenge her. We believe that she is trying to follow God the best that she can. But I want you to know that the same way that she has to think about those things is the same way we have to think about those things. See, the mission of God is not just for pastors. Hello. The mission of God is not just for the graduates from a theological school. The mission of God is for every person from the moment they say yes to Jesus, you are a missionary. Amen. From the moment, God, God is not waiting for you to have all the answers. You already have the answer that matters. Right. The moment that you say, yes, Jesus, I'm yours. He says, okay, now go. Now go. As you go, be the missionary into this world. So, so, so church, I, w- I want you to, I want you to hear this. God's mission, God's mission must be more important to you than every mission you have for your life. Than every vision, every goal, everything you strive for should pale and compare. Your life should sit, everything you're doing should simply be an avenue through which the mission of God can be manifested. The job you have, the family you're in, the neighborhood you're at, the recreational things you participate in, everything that we do should be subject to the mission that God has sent you on. I got one amen. I'll take it. I got three. I got, I got over there. I feel like I'm in an auction. I got four. There we go. Uh, I got five, six. Amen. All right. Here we go. Seven. There we go. Anyone, anyone else? Anyone else? Nine, ten. There we go. All right. Here we, hey, 11. There we go. 12, 13. There we go. <laughs> Amen. We're, gonna sign, we're all signing up for mission trips today. Amen. <laughs> Say this with me. Engaging with God. On mission, mission. will elevate elevate our vision. vision. Engaging with God on mission will elevate our vision. Look at verse 4. And being assembled together with them, he commanded, he didn't suggest, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. The first thing that happens here that we see is that his disciples were told to wait for something that was greater than they had ever known. They, 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 were, they were given a command to wait for a promise from the Father, which Jesus had obviously spoken of. They had heard him speaking of this. And, and, and he goes on in verse 5, For truly John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. But their, their vision had to, had to change of what they had seen, of what they had known. And because they were engaging with God on mission, then they were going to see something different. Go down to verse six and he tells them this and then this is their response. Listen to their response. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? That's their vision. That's what they see at this moment. Now, 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 now that's, that, that's a pretty big vision. Israel, Israel was under the bondage of Rome, you know, they, and I say bondage, they were under, you know, they, 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 were, they were subject to Rome's leadership in that moment. Rome was a, a strong empire, and so it wasn't like, you know, just some peasants, you know, with some, some you know, some pitchforks or something like that. We're going to go and overturn this, this great kingdom, right? That wasn't going to happen. So that, I think that's a pretty big vision, right? To restore the kingdom. They were waiting on the Messiah to come and the kingdom being restored to Israel. And then he goes on, look at his answer. He says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the father has put in his own authority. 
And he goes on and he tells them, but you shall receive power. So wait a second. So what? So, so they have a vision. And see, here's, here's why this is so important for us to grasp. is because much like the disciples, they had their vision of what it was that God, what they wanted God to, what they thought God should do for them. They had this, that God, this is what we need you to do for us. This is, in, in our lives, this is the breakthrough that we need in our family. This is the blessing we need in our business. This is the thing that we need. See, that's the mindset. Here's the thing. We all have this mindset mindset of what it is that we want God to do for us, not realizing, man, God wants to use us in a greater way. God wants to do something more than that. You see, as we consider the broken world around us, rather than becoming desensitized to the sin epidemic, we must recognize we are called to be the conduits of healing, of the healing solution, and that is the gospel. Are you here? You see, as we look around at the world around us, We have to realize God wants to use us in greater ways than we could ever imagine. God wants to do more through us than we could ever imagine. He wants to manifest his kingdom power through us. The the solution to the issues that we see around us in this world are not in politicians, are not in political parties. It's not in any of that. The solution to the condition of this world is in who? Jesus Christ. He is the answer to the brokenness in our world. He is the healer of those who need to be healed spiritually, those who are separated from God. That's what the gospel is about, is it not? It is about us being sinners, being born into sin, and us sinning and being separated from God, us being rebels against God, us not desiring anything to do with him. And yet, now check it out, we want something of him, we want some of the goodness that comes from him, but we don't want to bow to him, right? Right? This is, this is the thing about rebels. The rebels, right, we want all the good stuff. We, don't, we just don't want you to be king. <laughs> we, we want all of your blessing, right? We, we want, we want, we, listen, before we came to Jesus, we wanted money. Hello, somebody. Come on now. Before we came to Jesus, we wanted God to, to bless our stuff. Let me tell you how ignorant I was before I came to Jesus, right? So my grandmother, she was talking about this thing called tithing. If you don't know what tithing is, right? Tithing is separating 10% of your income, giving it to the kingdom, right? Giving it for the glory of God, right? So she's telling me this, and then she's explaining to me the blessing that is connected, right? Check it out now. The blessing that is connected to those who are tithing, right? So me, I'm a heathen. Not just a heathen, but I'm a broke heathen. Hello. And I have this, this, this wondrous idea. I'm going to start selling drugs. This is, this is my idea. Don't nobody do this. Hello, Bishop is not affirming this as good. Hello, this is bad. I just said this how stupid I was. Hello, now are you here? So I'm like, I'm going to start selling drugs, but check this out. I got a tithe to make sure that my drug business is blessed. Y'all think I'm kidding. You think I made that up. I did not make that up. I had a whole plan of how blessed I was going to be because I was going to tithe. Hello. God doesn't want my money. He wants my heart. But listen, I would give him 10% of whatever I was making as long as he blessed the rest. Hello. But he couldn't have my heart. I was going to continue in sin. I was going to continue. See, see, this is the bad news of the gospel. We want the benefits that God can offer us without the submission to his lordship. And so Jesus dies in our place in order to bridge this gap of separation, in order to deliver us from our foolishness. Hello. In order to deliver us from our blind, I was just blind. I didn't, I I didn't get the whole picture. I didn't realize what God, but, but this is where we, this is where the world is. We'll do just enough for God to bless us. But Jesus comes and dies, sheds holy blood, dies in our place, gives his life for us as a ransom, pays the price that we should pay. I didn't understand I was a sinner then. I didn't understand I was separated from God. I thought anybody could have God's blessing. Jesus dies, not to bless our mess, but to clean it up. He rises again to offer us new life, to offer us real hope, to give us, to give us a new name, to give us a new identity as sons and daughters that are loved by the most high God. 
This is the beauty of the gospel. And my friends, that's what you and I carry. That is the healing power to this world. The question is, do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that that is the solution to every ill that our world is experiencing? Do you believe in the power of the gospel, which it is the power of God unto salvation of all who believe? Do you believe that? Or is this just a cool message for church? Is this just a good, a good speech that Bishop does every week and he says the same thing over and over again? Is it just that? Or is it something that you believe can change someone's life? Because here's what I know. This idiot over here that wanted God to bless his drug selling business is now a follower of Jesus because the gospel entered in and yanked me out of my sin, yanked me out of my foolishness, delivered me from the power of darkness. And that is what the gospel is powerful to do. Do we believe that or not? The gospel is not just some cute message that we learn a presentation and and then we got it all right. No, it is the power of God. It is the dunamis of God. It is the delivering power of God to set people free. That is what the gospel does. But do we believe it? Or we become so desensitized, not just to sin, but even the gospel and what it is. We are supposed to be the carriers, the conduits of the gospel. You see, the disciples, they were told to do what? The first thing, again, that Jesus said to them, he commanded them to wait for the promise. Why? It wasn't just because they needed power. It's because they needed an elevated vision of what God really wanted to do with them. They had just walked with Jesus, like, (laughs) closely for three years. And they were still asking this same question. Are you, are, are you grasping that? I don't, know, I don't know if any of you have watched, are watching or have watched The Chosen. I know there's different opinions about that. Let me just say this about The Chosen really quickly. The first thing that I'm going to say is that there is creative license that they take in the, in the show, okay? And so just know that every single thing and every single word is not perfect. Hello. But I have enjoyed watching this show because they give you a picture of some things that you and I would just, it just goes over our head because we read stuff so quick if we read it at all. But when you sit down, you actually see these disciples, how they just, they don't understand Jesus the whole time they've been with him. They, they don't get him. And, and they, now, now I understand how they could ask this question after three years, after he rose again. And they're like, hey, are you going to, are, are you going to uh, establish the kingdom for Israel now? He's like, shut up. Have I not been with you all the, and you're still asking me the same question. It's not for you another season or time, but I have something better for you. I have some, I have, I have something more than just restoring the kingdom to Israel. I want to manifest my kingdom to the world. Oh, y'all didn't get excited enough about that. <laughs> I, I don't just want to bless a group of people. I want to bless the world with my kingdom. I want to bring Gentiles, that's all of us in this room. If it wasn't for the vision of God that he had for his disciples, you and I would not be sitting here. There would be one nation that would be blessed by God and all of us would have to convert to be Jews. That, that, that's what would happen. But instead, what God does, he says, to them, no, no, my, my, I, I want you guys to have a greater vision of my purpose, of my mission for your lives, what I have been discipling you for for three years. So wait, wait, so you'll be filled with power. See, we need to grasp the reality that God is not just filling us up to fix us up and make us look like some trophies on a shelf or a picture on a wall. But what God wants to do, he wants to fill us up to display his power and manifest his kingdom through us throughout the world and make himself known. Is that not an awesome thing? He wants to, he wants to us to be used by him. So the second thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this, say engaging with God, engaging with God. on mission, on mission. Requires, requires ability, ability. We, do we do not possess. The disciples had walked with Jesus for three years. And he still told them, wait. Oh, you've been taught by me. Oh, you, you've even been used in a way where you've done miracles. You, you have, listen, you read, read the scriptures. Read, read the text. 
You, the disciples had cast out demons. They had, they had brought healing to sick people. They had already been used in great ways while they were walking with Jesus. And yet Jesus still tells them, wait until you are filled with power. You see, you and I have to realize something. The mission that God wants you to engage with him on requires supernatural power. Supernatural power, this dunamis that I just talked about. That's what he said to them. He said, wait in Jerusalem, right? Verse five, he says, for John truly baptized, he, he, he baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, completely consumed, completely enveloped. That word baptized, it, it, it's a total dipping of a person in something with the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. In verse eight, the first part of it, but you shall receive power, dunamis. When the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What is this dunamis? This dunamis, it is the potentiality to exert force and performing some function. It means strength and power. It means ability. Here's what it is. We need the power of God to enable us to walk in the mission of God. Amen. We can't do, it, do this on our own ability. See, see th- 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 this is what I want you to understand. I want you to understand that you are not just a mom. You're not just a dad. You're not just a salesman. You're not just a husband or a wife. You are a witness to the resurrection of Jesus. And that is only possible by you and I being full of the spirit of God. Understand this. We look at our lives and we think, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a stay-at-home mom. That's it. <laughs> no stay-at-home mom ever said that. Hello. Huh. But, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just a worker, whatever your job is. I'm just this. I'm just, I want you to know that you are something greater than that. In the eyes of God, you are his ambassadors. You are his representatives. You are, wherever you are, whether, whether it's at home with your kids, whether it's with your spouse, whether it's with your coworkers, whether it is with your neighbors, you and I are more than just the thing that we are doing. We are missionaries. We are ambassadors. We are representatives of the king. Amen. And you and I, the same way as the disciples in this moment, do not have the ability to represent the resurrection of Jesus without power that's outside of ourselves. Without power that we do not possess in and of ourselves. Listen, I'm pretty sure that there are some extremely, extremely intelligent people in this room. I know there are. I know that there are some creative minds in this room. I know that there are, listen, there are some people in here, you have talents and abilities that we don't even know about. And here's what I want you to know. All of those things are insufficient to represent the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus is a supernatural occurrence. It is something that is beyond our minds to understand. In that chapter 17 of the book of Acts, if you go, you don't, don't go there now, but go back there later on. When you read chapter 17 in the book of Acts, you're going to see something. Everything that Paul was saying was good until the moment he started talking about the resurrection. The moment he started talking about the resurrection, these people were like, Psh, this guy's crazy. Dead people don't rise. No matter how many tears we cry, right? You ever lose somebody close to you and you're like, God, why? Lord, please. And you hope there, there might be some, you, you know what? There's probably not even any hope in you that they will rise again. You know why? Because dead people don't rise. There's nothing inside of you because that is something that is beyond this natural realm. It is something beyond us understanding. And so to be a representative of that, to be one that, 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 that is repre- you, you, you need something greater than you. You need power that is beyond ourselves. But here's our problem. The problem is we've reserved the need for the Holy Spirit's anointing to do holy things. Like church. <clears throat> Hello. We need, we, 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 we need Jesus, right? When we're going to sing, we need, the, we need the Holy Spirit to be here when we're going to sing. I hope, you know, you're, as, as a singer, musician, you're praying. Lord, we need your spirit to be present. We need you to be here. Let me ask you a question. Throughout the week, are you saying, God, I need you to be here? 
I don't know if you guys saw the post that, that, that Minister Hector did, but it was, it was a post. It's one of those posts where like you're, you're talking, but there's a voice and it's not really his voice. And so he's talking and you know, someone is saying, Hey man, do we really need Jesus to go to heaven? And he's like, bro, you need Jesus to go to Walmart. Hello. <laughs> Y'all remember that? Y'all go, go look it up on, on Instagram. It's pretty hilarious. He did a great job on that. But the fact of the matter is what? We're, we're, do we need Jesus to go to? Of course we need Jesus to go to heaven. But man, we need Jesus in every moment. of. It's the same thing with the Holy Spirit. We don't just need the Holy Ghost when we're coming to teach or we're coming to serve or we're coming to preach. We need the Spirit of God to be manifesting in us every moment of our lives. I know that seems super spiritual. But listen, you've been called out of darkness to be a peculiar people. You're not supposed to be like everybody else around you. You're, 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 you're not supposed to depend on the same things everyone else around you depends on. You should, listen, I, this, you should need to go and pound a few back so you feel okay like everyone else around you. What does the book of Ephesians say? Do not be drunk with wine which leads to dissipation or like that kid over there that was trying to sell weed and tithe foolishness, but be filled with the Holy spirit. You know where our peace comes from? A former weed head. Hello. Come on now. I didn't have peace unless I was high. I didn't have peace unless I was under the influence of some, you know where my peace comes from? It comes from the most high. It comes from him. It comes from his presence. You, you know where my joy comes from? It comes from him. You know where my, the love of, you know where it, it comes from him. We need his spirit. We're supposed to be different. Our lives should be different. Listen, we shouldn't laugh. We, we shouldn't laugh at the same stuff other people are laughing at. We shouldn't find that funny. And listen, we shouldn't give them the protocol laugh just because we don't want to offend them. Let me encourage you, give him, a, uh, give him a stank face, be like, that ain't funny. And if it is funny, you need to repent, hello. If you find that humorous, you need to check your heart. Why, why, why am I finding perverse things humorous? Why am I finding things that we shouldn't be laughing about funny? See, our heart should be different. Our heart, some, listen, this is resurrection life. This is a life that is full of the spirit of God that is dwelling us. See, here's the thing. We think that only pastors need the anointing. Hello. Only the preachers need to be really holy and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Like they need that. But here's the thing that there were 120 people in that upper room. There was 11 of them and would be 12 that were apostles. So you do the math because I'm terrible at math. I just know what 10% is. That's all I know. Hello. Come on now. <laughs> but you do the math. 120 people in that upper room were all commanded. Wait. They all needed the filling of the Holy Spirit. The book of Ephesians, that is speaking to the church and saying everybody needs to be filled with the Spirit of God. And let me say this. Being filled with the Holy Spirit isn't a one-time deal. That's why Ephesians, that word is in the, and I think it's an active indicative. I don't know, whatever. Well, meaning that it's a continual thing, right? It's a, it's a, always being filled, not just being filled once, but constantly being filled. Somebody asked me one time we were teaching on that. They're like, well, do we leak? I'm like, I don't know, but it seems that way. Hello. Do, you know, cause you feel something, right? If you have a vessel that is, that is good, right? If I, if I, I can, th this thing is only going to fill so much. If I keep filling it, it's going to overflow. So maybe that's what it is. Think about that. Maybe, maybe it's not that we leak. Maybe it's that God wants to fill us till we're overflowing into the lives of others. See the problem. We want to be filled for me. Oh, I got my feeling. I'm good. No, you and I need to be filled constantly overflowing into the lives of others. This is a supernatural thing. This is not just us. Oh, I got filled. I got a dab of do. I'm good. No, this is you being full of the spirit of God overflowing with the presence and power of God. Not just the pastors, not just the leaders. The problem is it seems like we think we're smarter than God. Hello. 
With all of our advancements in knowledge, we don't need to wait on God. We don't need to wait on his spirit. We don't need to wait in his presence. We need to read the next book to fix my problem. Hello. And listen, y'all, I love books. I, I, you, y'all know that. I love reading books. I, I, love, I love advising. Hey, read this book. This will help you. Hello. Some of y'all hate asking me questions because you're like, Bishop's going to give me another book. I'm not doing it. Yeah, because there are tools in that book. But listen, can I tell you something? You, you would not need to read another book on marriage. You wouldn't need to read another book on parenting. You wouldn't need to read another book on whatever thing it is you got going on if you would learn to wait in the presence of God and let his spirit overflow your life. See, the thing is we don't believe that. We don't, we don't realize that God is enough. He is the creator. And he promises to dwell in us. The question is, do we wait on him? Do we wait? I mean, these, these, these people, they waited for 10 days straight. Three prayer meetings a day. Forget Friday night prayer. Forget Wednesday prayer. Come on now. Three times every day, they were gathering together, seeking the Lord, praying, God, give us your promise. They didn't even know what they were waiting on completely. They didn't know that tongues of fire were going to come into the room. They didn't know that this wind was going to, they didn't know any of that. They were like, God, you said, wait, we're here waiting. Can you wait 10 minutes? Seriously. Can you just wait 10 minutes on God? Just humbling 10 minutes a day. Come on now. Just humbling yourself before him saying, God, fill me. God, I want to, I, I want to be filled. I want to overflow. I want to be, I want to be that conduit of your kingdom. The third thing I'll ask you to repeat after me is this, say, engaging with God, engaging with God. On, mission on mission must move us, move us outward. outward. The last part of that verse, verse eight, he says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me or you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. In the gospel of John chapter 20, I believe it is, Jesus conveys the idea that he has been sent of the father and he was sending his disciples the same way that he had been sent. And so we serve this God that comes, right? Jesus comes, but he is sent of the Father. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. His son is sent. So we serve a God who is sent, but he is also a sender. And he sends us as his representatives. He, he, he doesn't say, hey man, sit there and do it. That isn't what he said. He said, go. He said, go and make disciples is what the scriptures teach us in Matthew chapter 28. See, but I, I, want you, I want you to notice this. We are not just witnesses. We're not just witnesses, but we are, and I said it, my witnesses. Not my witnesses. There'd be a capital M there, depending on the translation that you have, meaning Jesus's witnesses. You are his witnesses. I was meeting, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting with a young man, and this is going to be my fourth week meeting with him. We're walking through this, these booklets called Life Issues, dealing with heavy questions that people have. He's reading through the Gospel of John. This will be our last week meeting, so pray for him um, that the Lord would use our conversations in order to bring him across the line of faith. That's my prayer, that his heart would be, would be softened. But as him and I were having this conversation, this last conversation, we started talking about the, the writings of the Scriptures, and, 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 and in those, in those days, and even in our days, I gave the example, I said, man, if someone saw you commit a crime and you went to court and they sat there and they testified against you, man, even if they didn't have like, let's say you killed somebody. I'm like, even if they didn't have the gun and they couldn't find the body, if you were over there giving details, you were talking about stuff, man, you'd be in a pretty bad place. It'd be even worse if they could say, Hey, and I know where the body is and I know where the weapon is. See, eyewitness testimony matters in our day, and in that day, even more so. And so what people don't realize for us, and this is a, a lesson for us as we think about witnessing to people, the Gospels were eyewitness accounts, right? And so they would have been held in a, in a court of law. They would have been able to do what? They would have been able to testify, 
they would have been able to communicate the things that Jesus actually did. And so what is Jesus saying here? He's saying to his disciples, because we, we got to keep it in context, right? He's saying to his disciples, you will be my witnesses. You will be my witnesses. Why? Because you saw me die. You saw me rise again. You saw me ascend. You're going to be directly my eyewitnesses. You and I are not direct eyewitnesses, but you and I can be filled with the witness. And that witness is the spirit of God who comes to dwell in us in order to be. And so I love this because he says, my witnesses. So you know what that shows? That shows something that is personal. Not just witnesses, but my witnesses. See, it's personal. So it's not just when, when I look at personal, there's ownership there. You're his. He's Lord. You're not witnessing to your stuff. You're witnessing to his stuff. It's not about you. It's not about me. It's about his kingdom, about his glory. But not just that. Here's what I love. I love this because it's not just ownership, but it's relationship. Here's what we have to know is that our God, he wants us to know his love. He wants us to know his holiness. He wants us to know his power deeply. He wants us to know him. He wants us to know his person. See, we, you and I, because of what Jesus did, get to enter into this relationship with this almighty God. Get to enter into this relationship with the creator of all. Think about this. The creator chose us to dwell in. How is that possible? The one who created all by his spirit, by faith, dwells in us. Mind-blowing. But, th- but, but that is what it means for you and I to be his witnesses. We get to know him. We get to walk with him. We get to engage him. We get to experience him. We get to be the vessels through whom he lives. See, here's the thing, church. God wants to establish his kingdom in us in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our region, in our nation, and throughout the nations of the world. Are you here? See, here's the problem with us. We're waiting for him to establish his kingdom in us perfectly, and then we'll move to the next task. We're waiting for him to establish his kingdom perfectly in our home And then we'll go to the next task. That's nowhere found in the pages of scripture. Listen, we need to submit ourselves to him. Submit, Lord, have your way in me. Continue to mold me. Let me ask you a question. Do you think that there is any perfect missionary on the mission field? Do you? Like, 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 there's, like there's a perfection test, right? That people take before they go into the mission field, right? Like you have to pass certain things before. Wait a second, that's not, that's not character. Hello, obviously we have to have character. But if you are submitted to God, just listen, there is no one with perfect character. There was one that was, Jesus. We are growing in perfection as we are on mission with him. So the question that, that, that we have to ask ourselves is how far will you go with the gospel? And here's the answer. The answer is how much will you surrender to the Lord? For some of you, man, God wants to take you across the world with this message. For some of you, God, listen, God has called you to be a, 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 a missionary overseas, a person who is not here so, some of you, he's called to do that. For, for, for most of us, though, you know what he's called us to? He's called us to be missionaries right where we are. For every one of us, he's called us to be missionaries right where we are. The question is, will you submit to him? And so here's my closing question. Would you say your life is on mission with God? Would you say that? That your life is on mission with God? That you are concerned with what it is that, that God is doing not just consumed by what you want to do. And if, if not, if you say, no, I, I can't say that, the question is, then do you want to be? Do you want to be? So I'll ask you to bow your heads right where you are.
Hey there, thank you so much for joining us this Sunday. I hope that your time with us was helpful. Hope that your time with us was edifying to you. And I just want to say thank you for all of your support. Thank you for the likes. Thank you for the shares. Thank you for the comments. If you are joining us for the first time online, would you please do us a favor and either email me at bishop at corefaithchurch.org. That is bishop at corefaithchurch.org. So I can thank you for being with us, get to know you a little bit better. Or if you have a prayer request, you can also email me there. Or if you're on Facebook, you can go ahead Ahead and you can leave us a message here uh, directly in the comment section, or you can send us an instant message and we'll get that and respond to you as soon as we can. Lastly, I want to say thank you to all of your to all of you for your financial support. And if you would like to contribute to Core Faith financially, there's a simple way to do it. You can give electronically. All you have to do is text Core Faith. That is one word. Core Faith to 73256. That is Core Faith, one word, to 73256, and then follow the prompts, and you can be a financial supporter of the mission that God has given us. And if you are supporting us financially, I want to say thank you so much. I pray that God will bless you abundantly. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.